Today, what I would like to tell you is how we think it's important to keep on studying on, on the pioneering activity and accessibility to, to fully understand transcription. And we know that gene activation is a really complex and dynamic process, and there is different uh, mechanisms that are involved. However, all, they all coincide with the activation uh, and formation of accessible chromatin that is activated by pioneer transcription factors, and before we already heard about them. They are a special class of transcription factors that can bind to condensed chromatin region, and they can release the DNA, and upon release, other, uh, other factors and uh, cofactors that can come in, and this is believed to mediate gene activation. However, when we look more in details, what we see is that we found many thousands of regions that are bound by pioneer transcription factors that not always undergo opening. And at the same time, we have really a lot of accessible regions in the genome. And although they are often used to uh, identify putative regulatory elements, they poorly correlate with active gene. So that means that there is a lot of genes that are being active, but around those genes, there, main, there is many different accessible regions. So what we want to do here, we want to understand which sites are actually dependent on a pioneer transcription factor, and eventually, can we identify the real functional regions for gene expression? So to do that, we uh, work on SOX2, uh, which is a well-known and a really uh, interesting transcription factor um, that is highly expressed in pluripotent cells, mostly in embryonic stem cells. Um, and it cooperates with other transcription factors, such as OT4 and ANOC, and uh, he tears up the pioneering act activity. So that means that can bind and open up inaccessible chromatin. And uh, recent, uh, two years ago, the RYOEM structures were resolved. And basically what they've seen that the uh, DNA binding domain of SOX2 uh, binds directly to the nucleosomal DNA. And this binding is believed to bend, literally bend the DNA from the nucleosomes. And this is believed to initiate uh, act opening of the nucleosomes uh, of the DNA. And also, SOX2 is really important for the maintenance of pluripotency cell, pluripotency. And here, for example, if we induce the degradation of SOX2 over a prolonged time, we see that after, like, already after 24 hours, the structure, so the morphology of the cells is abrogated. So, what we want to do, we want to investigate, you know, the primary roles of, of SOX2, and now we use a de degron system. So, we, here we use the DTAC system, where basically we fuse the SOX2 protein with a small tag FKBP, and that allows us, upon addition of a small molecule, the DTAC, to degrade the, the pro to degrade SOX2 in this case. And what we see is that already after 30 minutes of DTAC treatment, there is completely no SOX2 left, and that's persistent over time. Then we also perform mass spec to see the specificity of the, uh, of the system. And what was really nice to see is that indeed already after 30 minutes, only after 30 minutes of uh, SOX2 degradation, SOX2 is the only hit that we get. That is the only protein being degraded at that time. So now what we have basically is an ideal system where we can start to understand uh, indirect and the direct effect of a transcription factor loss. And that's what we're trying to do here, right? Because now with inducible diagrams, we can really start to understand cause and consequences of a transcription factor loss. But what we are interested in is a link between accessibility and transcription. So to do that, we uh, perform an attack sec uh, which is a method to uh, map the chromatin accessibility genome-wide. And we perform attack sec over a time course of SOX2 depletion. And but basically, what you see here is um, the region around this gene, in this case, is MIC. The promoter is highly accessible throughout all the time that you can see from the red signal here. And then we have a region just upstream, uh, the MIC gene, that loses accessibility again really fast after already 30 minutes of SOX2 loss. And then there is other regions that are more uh, transient, they are more uh, slow uh, to, do, to losing accessibility. Uh, however, what we see is that within six hours, we saturate all the effects. Now we can quantify the number of those uh, regions that lose accessibility, so here in, uh, in green at the bottom, or gain accessibility over time. What we see is that already after 30 minutes of SOX2 loss, there is already 15, almost 1,500 regions that lose accessibility, and that's really, it's really fast. And this, those numbers of regions that lose chromatin accessibility, they actually increase over time, um, reaching the highest number of 24. But now what we see is that there is also regions that gain accessibility. However, the regions that are gaining new accessibility are, they seem to be much more slower in the process. It's only after 24 hours that we get around 5,000 regions that have gained new accessible regions. But next, of course, we want to link it to transcription. So to do that, we perform TDCAM-C. 
Uh, and again, we do it in our SOX2 diagram background. And tdkm seq is just a method that uses a nucleotide analog, in this case for SU, that will get incorporated into the newly synthesized mRNA. And then you can use a biothin uh, enrichment to indeed enrich for the nascent RNA and then sequence everything that is being transcribed at that time. So we do that in the SOX2 diagram background. And what we see is that indeed, uh, after 30 minutes of SOX2 loss, then we, we have already hundreds of uh, genes that are, that are downregulated here in, um, in pink, but there is also an other set of genes that are upregulated that are here top in blue. And now what you see is that we have a balanced set of genes that are being uh, differentially transcribed. And this number increases over time. And now what you, what you can also appreciate is basically there is some transcripts that are first being downregulated here at one hour, and then they go up again to being normally transcribed again uh, after one hour time. One example of this is this, this gene, this uh, pluripotency associated transcript. So here, this is the TTSIC track, how it looks like. And what you see here is actually with TTSIC, you, you can now pinpoint the exact TSS of the gene, so where the transcript starts. And what we see is that indeed the gene is transcribed uh, with SOX2, and then after 30 minutes, it's gone. Now we take, take a look at how the accessibility looks like around this region, and what we see is that indeed, like here, there is this peak that loses accessibility at the same time point matching the uh, TTSIC that is highlighted here. So now we want to see how often we see this effect genome-wide. But now we also want to take into account the binding information of SOX2 because SOX2 is indeed a transcription factor that can bind the DNA by definition. And what we find is actually different categories. We have regions that have change in accessibility, so here in red with those arrows, they have strong, or at least they have a SOX2 binding site that, is, that can be detected. And then we have other regions that do have a strong change in accessibility, however, there is no detectable SOX2 binding site. And then we have a third category, which is regions that are bound by the protein, that are here in pink. They are bound by the protein, however, there is no change in accessibility whatsoever. So we can quantify the number of those regions genome mine in here, genome wide here, they are just uh, explained a bit better. And what we see is actually that the majority of regions, they contain a SOX2 binding site. However, they do not change accessibility upon SOX2 degradation. Then we have a third category where basically has the regions that are bound by SOX2 and they do respond to the degradation. So it's called our chip NDA here in the yellow. And then there is a third category, which is the regions that are they have really weak binding of SOX2, and they do respond to the degradation. So the accessibility here changes a lot. Then again, our link is to, uh, we want to link this different set of categories with activation of transcripts, right? So to do that, we take our different set of peaks, and what we simply do, we um, align them over the TSSs of downregulated genes and we match them with a number of genes that do not change expression. So we have two sets, downregulated genes and stable genes. And we just to look around how many times we found one of those three categories. And then we calculate the frequency uh, around their TSSs. And what we find is that indeed, like the regions that have SOX2 binding and do not change accessibility, they are indeed enriched around the TSSs of downregulated genes, which is the pink line here. However, the same type of enrichment is for the control genes. Then surprisingly, what we saw is that the regions with SOX2 binding and chromatin accessibility changing, it's really highly enriched around downregulated genes as compared to the control genes, which is the gray line. And the same is true also for only the differential accessible regions. So those are genes, uh, those are regions that are, don't have SOX2 binding, but they do show a change in accessibility. And they do, uh, they do, uh, lie within uh, regions, genes that change uh, expression. And what we also see from this analysis is that differential accessible regions, they always tend to lie within 40 KB or the TSSs of these genes. Next, what we want to do, we want to use this ATAC uh, set of peaks that we have, and we want to use it to predict downregulation of the genes. So basically, we have the differential attack peaks and the, only the chips on so the non-differential attack peaks. And we uh, just uh, want to predict indeed down-regulation over stable. And we, to do that, um, 
we uh, create a linear model where basically we take all our downregulated genes and then we look at the peaks around this gene and then we give a weight for uh, the peaks that we find within uh, uh, these regions. And then we, what we want to do, we want to discriminate as much as possible the true positive from the false positive, where the true positive are good prediction in downregulation. And if we now plot these proportions, what we see is that so if we plot the proportions of predicting the true positive rate over the false positive rate, what we see is that the regions that only have SOX2 binding, where basically nothing happens accessibility, they are really bad predictors of gene expression. So basically, they follow the diagonal here. On the other end, all the regions that show a change in accessibility, either with or without SOX2 binding, uh, they are much better at predicting down regulation. And you can see it from the area under the curve here. So the farther it goes, uh, the better it is at predicting. Now, uh, what we also want to do, okay, we, un we run our prediction algorithm hundreds of times, uh, and we want to understand how many genes can actually be explained by this loss of attack. Um, so what we find is that uh, there is around 70% of genes that can be correctly predicted uh, from only loss of accessibility uh, at a false positive rate of only 15%. Um, and this, what we see is that our pre uh, best prediction basically comes from uh, the two hour data point. So it's basically at, at six hours, we see this, this number starts to drop down. So that means that we are accumulating here a lot of secondary effect. Uh, and it's already started to be too late to actually understand the primary events uh, of accessibility. Next, uh, of course, this is a prediction, right? So we want to see if this prediction holds true in, uh, in our cells. And an example of this comes from this gene, which is KLF2, again, another uh, pluripotency-associated genes. And so here in yellow, what we, you see is the tt sick track. And you see that upon SOX2 depletion, the transcript is completely gone. Uh, and then what we, you see is that here in red, you have the attack track and the dynamics of it. And you see that the promoter doesn't change, like always. Um, and then there is a region downstream and other two regions upstream of these locals that they do change accessibility. And they, all those regions, they also have binding for SOX2. Now, what we also did, we performed microcapture C, and microcapture C is just, uh, um, let's say, the micro version of capture C. So they use an amenase digestion to have a best pair resolution and what we, uh, of the contacts. And this is important for us because basically we want to understand whether there is something interacting around KLF2 region. Uh, and what we see is that indeed the peak upstream, which is around five, four KB, uh, it's indeed strongly interacting with the promoter. And then also this other uh, differential accessible region also interacts with the promoter of KLF2. And this one is seven uh, best, uh, KB far away. But what is also interesting, and there is this bump of interaction here, uh, this, that happens at 15 KB farther away. You actually need to zoom in to see the interaction, but we probably are aware of it. The strength, you know, the, the intensity of this loop doesn't mean intensity of interaction. But basically to, um, to validate if our prediction of finding differential accessible regions, what we thought of doing is to knock out this, this site from our genome and just measure KLF2 expression. Uh, and if it, it, this indeed works as an enhancer, the expression of KLF2 should be reduced. And this is indeed what we see. So we have five different clones for the knockout of this region, and we compare uh, the expressional level of KLF2 with the five other clones that are parental cells wild time, also to see the heterogeneity of expression. And what we see is that in all five clones, the expression of KLF2 is reduced of approximately 85%. Then this for us was really interesting what we saw, even because we thought like the all three peaks will contribute to mediate KLF2 expression. But then when we saw the downregulation, the strong downregulation of KLF2 gene, we didn't really know what was going on. So what we did, we performed ATAC-SEC again in our clones, just to see that whether the loss of accessibility on one side might affect also accessibility of the other side. And this is not what we saw. So basically here I'm showing you three examples of the uh, attack in the knockout cells. And what you see is that indeed the region that we knocked out lost, has lost its accessibility. However, the locus remains, the, the other part of the locus remains accessible as before. So that suggests that indeed this differential accessible region can act alone uh, to activate KLF2 expression here. So this uh, brings me to my conclusions. And where basically now we have started to understand the direct role of SOX2 on transcription accessibility. 
And what we think happens is that you need this continuous pioneering activity uh, to maintain accessible chromatin that is promoted by SOX2. And then it is more important to have indeed this pioneering activity rather than stable binding to activate transcription. And what, then what we find is that all, our differential accessible regions, they, are, they work as cis regulatory elements for gene expression. And with that, I would like to thank everyone in my lab, like Elzo and Turn here that is doing all the analysis. And then uh, our collaborators, uh, James Davis for the microcapture scene. And thank you for listening. I was curious about the, so, so the regions where you found SOX2 binding uh, that reg seemed to have genes that were downregulated for only a short term, one hour, and then being upregulated again. So, so I may have missed something there, but is there other transcription factors cooperating with SOX2 that then turns it on again? Can you speculate around this? We don't really know. We looked at the motif analysis, and then, of course, we did a similar set of experiments with OCT4 and none of the ground lines. And in terms of motif, uh, mm -hmm. there's only SOX2. There is, I mean, of course, there is, there is different sites. Maybe I can show you. So yeah, we have the OCT4, the SOX2, and the nano background. And what we find is that regions that, have, that are going down with both OCT4 and SOX2 depletion, and regions that are dependent only on one. But then when we look at the motif, the majority is either the combined OCT4, SOX2, or the SOX2 alone, or the OCT4 alone we don't find another motive, like another factor. Mm -hmm. So in the case of those gained uh, and lost and gained uh, up and down, maybe OCT4 is going there, but I don't know. Because then the other interesting bit we see is that there is a lot of dynamics in terms of, re of sites. So maybe the dynamics can explain those, but we didn't really look into that. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. So did you see changes in CTCF occupancy when you get rid of it? No. no. And actually, that's an interesting bit, because all those regions, there's no CTCF. Uh, so those loops are not CTCF mediated. What we have, it's farther away. So imagine this uh, going uh, farther. Then you have the two CTCF sites, and there's also a loop called when micro, micro C. Uh, but they are farther away. So, so, so these interactions were not CTCF mediated? No. But did, I wonder whether you can check whether they're cohesion mediated? They are also not cohesion. There's no cohesion uh, binding there. So there is, okay. let's say, the first CTCF, it's around uh, 25 KB further. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is like 30. Uh, and this is the first one we can find. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we also do the prediction using um, loops called the micro seed, then the prediction also drops. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and do you see changes in 27 acetylation when you get rid of? Yeah, that's interesting because I only have uh, one replicate for cheap. Okay. Uh, but I do see changes uh, over time. But of course, I need, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah. there is definitely something going on with acetylation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for the talk. So I, I, w I was curious about the third category of uh, loci that don't have. SOX2 binding, or at least very little, but that change accessibility. So do you think this is indirect effect or related to also large-scale organization that this loci I mean, interact with SOX2 regions or something like that? So it can be two things. Either the um, SOX2 is not binding stable enough to be detected by CHIP, um, because we know that CHIP in, indeed is a static method. So it just, you know, capture, and then of course there is a bulk average. So maybe the binding at those sites is not stable enough to be detected by CHIP. Uh, or there is something else that keeps them open, let's say. Uh, because in terms of motif, there's nothing clear. Um, yeah. But that's the thing, like, is the pioneer, like, is it being open that matters, apparently. Yeah. Once you deplete SOX2, you have a, a gradual loss of uh, accessibility and uh, like you, for, for a while you have no gain of accessibility and then you have a brief uh, one. So I was wondering whether you think that this might be um, coordinated with the division, I yourself dividing, because this was around 24 hours? Yeah, this is, I don't know, but I also think that uh, like at 24 hours, so the gain of new accessible sites, you know, it's something that is established maybe after the cell cycle. But I don't know that because the cells do proliferate. I mean, they do differentiate upon 24 hours, but I don't know. I didn't do this analysis. Thank you, Michaela. Nice talk. Um, I wonder if you use, 
you show one slide that you use, you look at motifs in the sites that change uh, accessibility, I guess. I wonder if you have used this to improve your prediction algorithm to predict the expression of the genes nearby. To use the motifs? Yeah, to motif the, the availability or not of a particular motif. Sites. No, we did not do that. I mean, it's true the motifs, they are everywhere. Uh, of course, but on those Maybe like to settle down, yeah, to, no, yeah. So just looking, taking the motif as input, basically. Yeah. I think this could be very, very interesting.